die Versorgung der Krankenhäuser mit Treibstoff und lebenswichtigen Medikamenten.
zweitens die Versorgung der Krankenhäuser mit Treibstoff und lebenswichtigen Medikamenten.
Drittens, die Versorgung der Krankenhäuser mit Treibstoff und lebenswichtigen Medikamenten. Avner Gvariahu, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. I think it's fair to say the IDF is probably the most sacrosanct institution in all of Israel. Was it hard for you to, to cross a line, to break the taboo and speak out against what the IDF is doing? You know, breaking the silence, I think, in any context isn't easy. Uh, definitely in the Israeli society. Um, it's not a natural thing in that sense to, to break uh, that kind of silence. Uh, but I think that um, myself, like uh, over 1,000 soldiers that are part of Breaking the Silence, former soldiers, it was much, much more difficult for me to keep my silence um, than to break it. Um, and it's true that there are prices, uh, but the truth of the matter is that I care too much for my country and my society um, to keep silent. Um, and although there are pushbacks, uh, we will persevere. You broke the silence after you'd put your uniform away and left the IDF. Were you silent while you were a serving soldier? Well, I didn't feel that I was silent. Um, I remember um, occasions where I brought up uh, what I was doing in the nights uh, in Nablus and Janin. Uh, when I was uh, back home, um, I thought that I was in silence when I asked uh, my soldiers what they thought about these operations. But it actually took me a while um, 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 after my service where I actually thought that I could put my military service behind me to realize that I myself was also silent, that I myself was also not really frank when I was looking myself in the mirror. So you were, to, to use that phrase, a good soldier. You followed orders. And you did things which, and I'm now asking rather than stating, I'm guessing you did things which your moral conscience told you you should not be doing, but you did them anyway and did not speak out against them. That's true. I mean, I was a sergeant of a sniper's team. And one of the routine missions that we carried out uh, in Nablus, in Janine, or in the, in the surrounding areas of those two cities um, was a mission that we called a straw widow. A straw widow was when you take over a Palestinian home Every house in the West Bank actually has a number. Each and every house has a number. So we would open up the maps and look at the specific house that uh, looked into the right place that we had to enter, uh, a city center or a road. Um, and after we would verify that the house has the best parameters, windows, and geographical area, we made sure the people in the house were innocent. So you, we, we would enter a house of an innocent Palestinian home in the middle of the night. The first missions that I carried out, the adrenaline was pumping. The second, the third, the fourth, when it started to calm down, I realized I was sitting in someone's living room, bedroom, uh, children's room. That was when it started to break. And you are dealing with people in fear. Constant fear, but I have to say the fear is, is, is two-sided. I was also full of fear. But I, I would say that what, 
uh, um, motivated me eventually to break my silence was the piercing eyes of young Palestinians when I was barging into their house in the middle of the night. I could always justify it to myself, but those eyes, the anger, their fear, uh, was what eventually helped me overcome that. Uh, a house of a physician in Nablus, for example, that I entered in the middle of the night, uh, taking him, his wife, and his daughter, and, and pushing them in a room. If they wanted to use their bathroom or their kitchen or use their phone, they need permission from me. Um, that specific house in Nabla stayed with me for a while because that physician himself was kind enough and generous enough to sit down and explain to me what it means to be a Palestinian. And, and that experience, when I was sitting there in a house in Nablus, made me realize what I'm actually doing um, as a soldier to millions and millions of people, me, myself, not someone else, uh, not a different unit uh, of Nair. And I thought that I was a good moral soldier, but I was actually helping entrench the occupation in that sense. I just want to be clear. Are you saying that the very act of going into the house of an innocent Palestinian family to you was and is totally unacceptable and corrosive and doing serious damage to the sort of moral values of Israel's army and indeed the nation state? Or are you saying that that's just the tip of an iceberg of behavior, much of which is much worse than that? Yeah, I would say that when you look at the past 50 years, uh, entering the 51st year, you look at the past 13 years that we've been collecting testimonies from soldiers, then you have different kinds of testimonies. Um, so like the straw widow that I just talked about, I could talk about the flying checkpoint or entering uh, um, houses for searching or checkpoints or making our presence felt uh, instilling fear into the Palestinian population or the actual orders war instilling the sense that they're being chased showing there's a new sheriff in town there's a constant system it's, it's the imposition of a basic power dynamic the message being we're in control we're in charge of you and your lives and we in essence can do what we want that's true and I would say that in that you have uh, mundane routine operations of just uh, uh, having a, you know, standing in a checkpoint or walking that through a city center or a village. Um, and you can have cases in this military occupation of violence, of destruction of property, of humiliations of Palestinians. We've collected dozens of these testimonies. That's not the problem of the occupation. It's a symptom. The problem is the idea of controlling millions of people by force indefinitely. And that's where the state of Israel is going. That's where the government is actually taking us, an indefinite military occupation. But, but this, in the end, what you're outlining as, as your um, critique of what is happening in Israel and that the IDF, as, as the agent of occupation, is doing, is essentially political. I mean, you're saying, if I understand you correctly, that the very act and policy of occupation is corroding Israel's value and must end. But... The truth is, time after time after time, the Israeli public votes in elections for parties which sustain and believe in that occupation. I mean, that, that's true, but um, when you look at this democracy, it's basically a democracy that is controlling and ruling um, millions of people that don't have a right or a say in that democracy. So between the river and the sea, you have about 13 million people where half of them do not go and elect anyone. So a big part of our mission, and that's where we spend as Breaking the Silence, the vast majority of our energy and our time is speaking to our uh, uh, fellow citizens. Um, cr all across Israel, um, we're actually the leading organization in the anti-occupation camp in the sheer numbers of people that we meet. But we also recognize that the houses that we entered were not houses of Israelis. And the occupation is not an internal Israeli issue. It's an issue that affects millions of Palestinians, and obviously, the international community is, in, is involved as well. Yeah, and I, I want to come back to the politics of this uh, in some detail, but, but just to stick for now with testimony, because Breaking the Silence is all about gathering together the voices of soldiers, former soldiers, who are no longer prepared to be silent about what they've seen. I just want you to be very clear with me about some of the other behaviors, because you've talked about the day-to-day -day dull routines of occupation, but the other behaviors 
behaviors like, for example, testimony about looting, stealing, Israeli soldiers stealing from inside Palestinian family homes, other testimony about deliberate acts of violence, striking youths, striking people in their own homes, beating them, also firing rubber bullets, transgressing the limits that are supposed to be imposed on the firing of those bullets and undoing the packaging so they do more damage. All of these aren't just about the routines of occupation. They suggest to me an army that has within it significant numbers of soldiers who want to do bad things. I mean, you, you, you can choose to look at it like that. I think it's more complex. But it's not I, important to be honest that there are Israeli soldiers, if this testimony is true, many say it's not, but if it's true, there are people in the IDF doing very bad things. I mean, yeah, I could say more than that. I was one of those soldiers doing very bad things. Um, I saw it with my own eyes. I was part of it. I was violent. And I think in that sense, it's not about pinpointing a specific soldier individual. And I don't think that there are Israeli generals waking up in the morning saying, how can I make the lives of Palestinians miserable? But there is a system that for now 51 years is constantly thinking, how can we maintain the status quo? Or I would say, let's take it a step further, how can we entrench it? The Israeli occupation, I think, has built in the mindset of the Israeli society a false equation that basically says it's a zero-sum game. It's either us or them. And in order for us to feel secure, they have to feel insecure. And when you have an, an, an entire army or, not, or a vast majority of the Israeli army, which is in charge of maintaining that military control. So the mission is control. The symptom is exactly what you talked about. Now, those symptoms will not disappear until we end the occupation.